My name's Gina. I used to be a figure skating coach before my life took a whole different turn. It was back at the rink where I spent most of my days, either gliding on ice or teaching kids how to stand on their skates without falling flat. It was a regular Tuesday morning when I first saw Tom. He was at the rink, obviously out of his element, clutching the railing like it was the only thing between him and a frozen grave. His niece, Lily, who was about seven, zipped around him, her laughter echoing off the cold walls. Hey, need a hand? I skated over to Tom, amused by his cautious stance. He looked up, relief washing over his face. Yeah, thanks. I'm Tom, and this is Lily, he gestured to the whirlwind niece of his who was now attempting a spin. Gina, I introduced myself, offering him a smile. And don't worry, you're not the first adult to look like they're auditioning for Bambi on ice around here. He chuckled, easing up a bit. That obvious, huh? I'm just trying to keep up with her, he nodded towards Lily. But I swear, she's more at home here than I am in my office. We chatted more as I gave him a few tips on how to skate without clinging to the sides. He was quick to learn, or maybe he was just trying really hard not to embarrass himself in front of his niece. Either way, it was fun watching him get the hang of it. Uncle Tom, look. Lily called out, doing a little jump. I laughed. You've got a natural there. Ever thought of getting her into lessons? Tom glanced at me, then back at Lily, who was now skating towards us. I've thought about it. Do you give lessons? Sure do, I replied. I teach kids her age all the time. She'd fit right in. He seemed to think it over as he watched Lily join us, her face flushed with cold and excitement. What do you think, kiddo? Wanna learn some cool tricks? Lily's eyes lit up. Yes, please, Uncle Tom? He nodded, looking back at me. Guess we're signing up then. From that day, Tom started bringing Lily to her lessons regularly. We got to talking more and more. He was funny in a dry sort of way, and I liked that. He'd hang around during the lessons, sometimes even lacing up a pair of skates and trying a few moves himself. One day, after the rink had emptied and it was just the two of us left, he asked me out. It was straightforward, no fancy lines, just a simple, wanna grab dinner sometime? That dinner led to many more, and before I knew it, we were inseparable. Life was simple, filled with laughter, chilly mornings at the rink, and quiet evenings out. Life after marrying Tom seemed like it settled into a comfortable pattern faster than I thought possible. Moving out of my small apartment and into a house with Tom felt like the first real grown-up thing I'd ever done. We filled it with furniture, laughter, and eventually, the cries and giggles of our kids. Tom's family was a big part of our lives. His mom, Janet, and dad, Mike, were over so often it felt like they lived with us half the time. Janet loved to come over and fuss over everything, from the garden to my cooking, which she couldn't praise enough even though I knew I was no master chef. You've got to teach me how to make this lasagna, Gina, Janet would say nearly every time, her voice loud and filled with genuine enthusiasm as she helped herself to another hefty slice. It's no secret recipe, Janet. Just followed the instructions on the box and added a pinch of love. I'd joke back, and she'd chuckle, wiping her mouth with a napkin. Tom's sister, Sarah, and her daughter, Lily, were regulars too. Lily was growing so fast, and watching her and my own kids play together brought a sort of peace and happiness that was hard to describe. One Sunday, while the kids were sprawled on the living room floor with their coloring books and toys, Sarah and I sipped coffee in the kitchen. You've made a nice life here, Gina, Sarah noted, her tone a mix of admiration and a hint of something else, maybe wistfulness? I guess we did, huh? I responded, leaning back in my chair. It's noisy, messy, and chaotic, but it's ours. Sarah laughed, her voice echoing slightly in the kitchen. That's family. Tom's really stepped up, hasn't he? Being a dad suits him. I smiled, thinking about how Tom had indeed taken to fatherhood with a surprising amount of grace. He's great with them. Still, he's been working so much lately. Yeah, he mentioned the new project at work. Sounds like a beast. 
Sarah sympathized, stirring her coffee absent-mindedly. Tom had been staying late at work more often, coming home after the kids were in bed. I understood, his job was demanding, and he was the sole breadwinner now that I had quit working to raise the kids. That night, after the kids were asleep and I was folding laundry, Tom came home. He looked exhausted, his suit rumpled and his hair a mess. You look like you've been through a war, I said, half joking as I walked over to help him with his coat. Tom forced a smile, his eyes tired. Feels like it sometimes. These clients are driving me up the wall. We ate in a comfortable silence, the kind that comes from knowing someone so well that words aren't always necessary. But underneath that comfort, a thread of worry nagged at me. Tom was pulling away, bit by bit, lost in his work. Later, as we lay in bed, I turned to him, the moonlight casting shadows across our room. You okay? You've been really distant lately. Talk to me. Tom turned to face me, his expression unreadable in the dim light. I'm just tired, Gina. It's this project. It won't be like this forever, I promise. As sleep claimed me, I hoped that he was right, that work was just a temporary wedge and nothing more. Because deep down, I feared what it might mean if our little bubble of domestic bliss burst. When I found out I was pregnant with our third child, it was a mix of joy and apprehension. I told Tom the news one evening after he'd come home late from work, looking as weary as ever. Tom, I have something to tell you. I'm pregnant, I said, my voice a mix of excitement and nervousness. He looked up, surprise etching his face before it softened into a smile. Really? Wow, that's, that's great, Gina, he said, and for a moment, he seemed genuinely happy, the tired lines around his eyes smoothing out. But the smile didn't reach his eyes, and he sank into the chair as if the weight of another responsibility was too much to stand. It's wonderful news, I continued, trying to gauge his reaction. But, Tom, I'm gonna need you more at home. With three kids, it's gonna be a lot. Tom's face changed then. The brief joy faded as reality hit him. More at home, Gina? You know my work's crazy right now. How am I supposed to? I know, but it's our family, Tom. It's your kids too, I interrupted, feeling a sting of frustration. I do my part, Gina, he snapped back, his voice raising. I work all day to provide for us. I need to rest, not come home to more work and screaming kids. I swallowed hard, watching him walk away, feeling more alone than ever. His words hurt, but I tried to shake it off, telling myself he was just stressed. The months that followed were tough. My belly grew, and so did the distance between Tom and me. He started using work as an excuse to stay away, even more, coming home only to lock himself in his office, or leaving before dawn for so-called business trips. When our third child, Mia, was born, I hoped it might bring us back together, that seeing her tiny face would remind Tom of what was important. But it only seemed to drive him further away. He barely looked at Mia, and when he did, it was with a hollow kind of detachment. Tom, won't you hold her? I asked one evening, when he was actually home. I held Mia out to him, her little eyes blinking sleepily. Tom glanced at her, then back at his phone. I've got to take this call, he said, turning away. It felt like a punch to the gut. I nodded, saying nothing, and turned back to Mia, whispering apologies into her soft hair. Days turned into weeks, and Tom's absences grew longer. When he was home, his irritation flared at the smallest noise, and I felt like I was constantly smoothing things over, keeping the kids quiet, keeping the house calm, all while my own heart was anything but. The day was just about winding down when my phone rang. It was a number I didn't recognize, and hesitating only a moment, I answered it while trying to soothe Mia, who was fussy after her nap. Mrs. Thompson, a deep voice inquired on the other end. It sounded formal, serious. Yes, this is she. How can I help you? This is Paul Richards, the director at your husband's company. I'm sorry to disturb you, but we've been trying to reach Tom all day. We urgently need him back at the office. A cold prickle ran down my spine. Oh, he's on a business trip right now. 
won't be back till next week, I responded, my voice steady, despite the sudden thump of my heart. That's impossible, Mrs. Thompson, Paul's voice was confused and a bit impatient. We don't have him down for any business trips. And in fact, he took personal leave saying he needed to help at home with the new baby. My hand tightened around the phone. I, there must be some mistake. He left for a trip a few days ago. There was a pause on the other end, and then Paul spoke again, his voice softer this time. I see. If you do hear from him, please have him contact me directly. It's urgent. I hung up, the silence in the room now screaming loud. Tom's lies were unraveling faster than I could keep up with. He wasn't on any business trip. He had been lying for who knows how long. The pain of realization was sharp, almost physical. I tried to focus on the rest of the day, but my mind was spinning, my thoughts dark and tangled. When Tom finally came home later that week, acting like nothing was out of the ordinary, I felt sick watching him. He kissed me his forehead and complained about the long flight he'd supposedly just endured. I said nothing about the call from his director. Instead, I watched and waited. The next day, as Tom took a long shower, I noticed his phone lying on the dresser, surprisingly not password protected at this moment. My hand shook as I picked it up and started going through his messages. There, right in front of me, were dozens of texts and photos, not just any photos, but intimate ones with his secretary, a young woman named Marissa. They spoke of meetings when he was supposedly working late and little getaways when he was on his so-called business trips. I felt like I couldn't breathe. My hands automatically worked to forward the messages and photos to my email. I needed proof. After I made sure there were no traces left of what I'd done, I put his phone back exactly where he'd left it. Tom came out of the shower, relaxed, and oblivious to the storm raging inside me. He rambled on about his day, complained about being tired, and how he needed a quiet evening. Rough day? I managed to ask, keeping my voice neutral. Yeah, you know how it is. Non-stop action. He replied, collapsing on the sofa and flipping through the channels. I just nodded, feeling numb. After making sure the kids were settled in their beds, I sat at the dining table long after Tom went to bed, staring at the empty chairs around me. My life as I knew it was falling apart. Seeing Tom every day, knowing what I knew, was like swallowing poison. My heart burned with a silent rage, and yet I smiled through it all, keeping my plans close to my chest. I was going to expose his betrayal, his lies, in front of everyone we cared about. My birthday was fast approaching, and it would be the perfect stage for unveiling the truth. I started planning the party with a singular focus. I sent out invitations to all our family and friends, rehearsing my speech late at night when the house was quiet. Tom has been living a lie, I practiced saying to my reflection, my voice steady. And we've all been his audience. Tom seemed oblivious to my inner turmoil. He even helped with the party preparations, suggesting decorations and discussing the menu. His involvement was a cruel irony that wasn't lost on me. The day before my birthday, everything was set. The decorations were up, the food was ordered, and my speech was burned into my mind. That's when Tom dropped his bombshell. I've got to head out to the airport tonight. Urgent business in Chicago, that can't wait. I'll be gone for two weeks, Tom announced casually over dinner, as if he were merely stepping out for a quick errand. My fork clattered to my plate. What? But my birthday is tomorrow. You can't be serious. Tom didn't meet my eyes. I'm really sorry, Gina. It's this new client, big opportunity. I can't pass it up. I knew better. There was no client, no business trip. It was her, his mistress. That's who he was choosing over me, over us, once again. Right. Work, I said, the word bitter on my tongue. I'll make it up to you, Gina. We'll celebrate when I get back, okay? He smiled at me, but I didn't return his smile. As he walked away, my thoughts raced. This was it, the moment where I could have brought everything crashing down around him. But he was leaving, and my plans for a public confrontation were ruined.
I watched from the window as he drove away, my heart a mix of fury and despair. My birthday would still come, and though my plans were foiled for now, this wasn't the end. I would find another way, a better moment, to reveal the truth. The morning after Tom left was the day of my birthday party. The house quickly filled with family and the warm chatter of familiar voices. My parents were the first to arrive, followed closely by Tom's parents, his sister Sarah, and her daughter Lily. They came bearing gifts and smiles, ready to celebrate. As the children played in the background, my mother-in-law, Helen, looked around, her expression turning puzzled. Where's Tom? Isn't he joining us for your birthday, Gina? I hesitated, a lump forming in my throat. I had planned this moment, rehearsed the words, but facing it head-on felt overwhelming. Actually, can we gather in the living room? There's something important I need to discuss with all of you, I managed to say, my voice steady. Curious and somewhat concerned, everyone moved to the living room, settling into the sofas and armchairs. I sent Lily to watch over the younger kids, ensuring they were occupied and away from what was about to be an adult conversation. Once everyone was seated, I took a deep breath, holding onto the back of the couch for support. Helen's eyes were fixed on me, filled with worry. Gina, what's wrong? Where's our son? I pulled out my phone, opening the gallery where I'd saved the evidence of Tom's infidelity. There's no easy way to say this, but Tom hasn't been honest with us. I began, my voice clear despite the shaking of my hands. I turned the screen to face them, showing a photo of Tom with his mistress, their intimacy undeniable. A gasp echoed through the room, most audibly from Helen and Mike, Tom's parents. Sarah's hand flew to her mouth, her eyes wide with shock. For years now, Tom has been distant, more involved with, her, than with his own family. I continued, the words tasting bitter. He told me he was on a business trip yesterday, on the eve of my birthday, but that was a lie. He's with her right now. The silence that followed was heavy, loaded with betrayal and disbelief. Helen's face crumbled, tears welling up in her eyes. Mike's jaw was clenched, his hands balled into fists. Helen reached out across the space between us, taking my hand. Oh, Gina, how long have you known? Only a few days, I admitted. I found out, just before he left. I'm sorry to drop this on all of you like this, but I didn't know what else to do. Mike stood abruptly, pacing a few steps, before turning to face me. He's my son, but I can't condone this. Not when he's hurt you, and the kids like this. What are you planning to do, Gina? My resolve hardened, fueled by their support. I'm planning to file for divorce. I can't be with someone who has so little regard for his family. The room was quiet again, everyone processing the bombshell I had just dropped. Then, one by one, they began to express their support. If that's your decision, you have our full support, Gina. You and the kids are our family too, Mike said firmly, his voice rough with suppressed emotion. Helen squeezed my hand tighter. Whatever you need, we're here for you. I'm so sorry our son caused you this pain. Sarah came over and hugged me. We're with you, Gina. All the way. Tom needs to answer for this. I was glad my loved ones supported me, but I voiced a concern that had been gnawing at me ever since I decided on the divorce. I don't know what I'm going to do next, I admitted to the room. I can't stay in this house. It's too much. But I've got nowhere to go with the kids. My parents immediately offered to take us in. You and the kids can come back home, my dad said, his voice steady and reassuring. But before I could respond, my father-in-law stood up. Actually, the house you're living in now. Mike started, his tone serious. It's under my name. I think it's best if we sell it. There's a house near ours that's just come on the market. It would be perfect for you and the kids. The room paused, everyone processing Mike's words. My mother-in-law clapped her hands, a smile spreading across her face. Oh, that would be wonderful. Having the grandchildren close by, and Gina too, it would mean the world to us. The decision was made quickly after that. Mike and Helen moved forward with selling the house. 
It was a whirlwind, and before I knew it, they had not only sold it, but also purchased the new home near them. The efficiency and support from Tom's family were overwhelming in the best way possible. The move was a flurry of activity. Boxes were packed, furniture moved, and my life repacked into a new setting with an incredible speed. My parents, Mike, Helen, and Sarah were all hands on deck, making the transition as smooth as possible. It was during these days of setting up our new home that I finally dealt with the last piece of my old life with Tom. I gathered all his belongings, which weren't many, since he'd taken a lot with him on his supposed business trip. With the help of my father, I shipped everything to Tom's office. Included in the boxes was a letter, not just to him, but to his director. I detailed everything, from the affair to the lies about his business trips. That night, after the kids had gone to bed in their new rooms, I stepped out onto the small porch of our new house. The air was cool, the sky clear and full of stars. Mike came outside, joining me. How are you holding up, he asked, his voice gentle. I'm okay, I said, looking out into the night. Actually, I'm more than okay. I feel free. Mike nodded, understanding. Good. You deserve to be happy, Gina. All of you do. We will be. I replied, a newfound resolve strengthening within me. We're going to be just fine. And as we stood there, the quiet night around us, I believed it. With the support of my family and the promise of new beginnings, I was ready to face whatever came next. I wasn't just surviving, I was ready to thrive. The real drama unfolded when Tom returned from his business trip. He went straight to our old house, expecting everything to be as he left it. I heard about what happened next from Sarah, who heard it from a neighbor. Tom tried to unlock the door, but of course, the keys didn't work, new locks. He started pounding on the door, loud enough to startle the new tenants who had just moved in. Confused and annoyed, the man who opened the door was met with Tom's bewildered and angry face. Where's Gina? What the hell are you doing in my house? Tom had demanded, his voice booming. The new tenant, taken aback by Tom's aggression, threatened to call the cops. Tom, flustered and fuming, pulled out his phone and dialed my number. I answered, knowing this call was inevitable. What the hell, Gina? Why can't I get into the house? Who are those people? Tom's voice was loud and frantic over the phone. I replied calmly, each word deliberate and clear. I sold the house, Tom. And I'm not going to tell you where we are now. You should probably go stay with your mistress. The line went silent for a moment before he erupted again, cursing, demanding explanations. But I had said what I needed to. I hung up, my heart pounding but my resolve steady. Tom, lost and desperate, went to his parents' house next. But Mike and Helen were firm. They had already chosen their stand. When Tom showed up at their doorstep, hoping for solace or a place to stay, Mike met him at the door. We can't support you in this, Tom. What you did to Gina and the kids, we're ashamed. Mike had told him, his disappointment heavy in his voice. Tom lost it then, yelling about being their son and how they couldn't just turn him away. But Mike was adamant, the door closing on Tom's pleas and curses. Back at work, things didn't go any smoother for Tom. I got the details from my friend Liz, who works in HR at Tom's company. The director had called him in first thing, laying down the consequences of his actions, not just the affair, but the misuse of company time and resources. Tom was transferred to another branch effectively immediately. His secretary was fired, the company keen to wash their hands clean of any part in Tom's personal mess. Tom was livid, lashing out as he packed his things, kicking boxes, and throwing papers. It was a low point for him, but for me, it was a strange kind of closure. I filed for divorce shortly after, citing his infidelity. I included the evidence I had gathered, making sure my case was ironclad. I wasn't vengeful, but I needed to secure a future for our children. The court proceedings were swift, thanks to the overwhelming evidence and Tom's somewhat tarnished reputation. In the aftermath, I turned back to the one thing that always brought me peace, figure skating. I got a job teaching at a local rink. 
morning sessions only, leaving my afternoons and evenings free to be with my kids. Life now is a far cry from where I was just a few months ago. The kids are thriving, closer to their grandparents, who spoil them rotten with love and toys. My evenings are filled with homework, laughter, and the occasional movie night. It's simple, but it's ours.